Hello. <laughs> I have to get used to this. So uh, my name is Paul Fletcher. I'm the photography teacher for the camera arts program at Brentwood College. And you're, I'm inviting you to listen to my webinar called Welcome to Tips for Taking Better Photographs. Um, I've been a photographer for 30 years. Um, I'm, I've uh, stock shot for travel to uh, different agencies, including Lonely Planet and uh, Getty. And I, my passion is portraiture, travel photography, and art photography. As uh, many of you might know, photography started in the mid 1800s. And it was a very slow process. Each in individual image took a lot of effort. Um, it, it took hours and hours, and usually you had to get this process one at a time um, with glass, with dangerous chemicals. The process changed over the years and improved, obviously, when Kodak came out and provided a camera for the masses. And in doing that, they created a camera, it was a box camera, and basically their, their, what they said was, uh, you take the photo, we do the rest. So you send the box to them, it comes back loaded, and your pictures. So that's when the masses started really enjoying photography. The new wave is happening now because the masses are enjoying photography even more with digital photography. So what I was going to, I have to excuse myself for a second, um, carry on. So the, the photography program that I teach captures the essence of the past by having a beginners explore the traditional processes, including developing film and printing black and white photographs. Um, learning the origins and playing with processes and techniques and design to, to do, create their own black and white photographs is the perfect introduction to our digital program in the second year. Patience, thought, understanding and feeling rarely come when you pick up a digital camera for the first time and start practicing photography. That's basically what I'm going to get into today. I'm going to show you how to make pictures much better um, just with some very simple techniques. And well, let's go this way. So black and white photography came out, uh, like I said, in the early 18, mid 1800s, and it developed until color film came along. So black and white film in those days was absolutely about tone and subject and how you dealt with those tones and how you presented that subject. How you dealt with those tones was a very technical process and how you dealt with the subject is where you basically place the subject in your image or however you chose to frame that, uh, that, that image that you were going for. So basically, uh, I don't like this thing. <laughs> so again, I'm just moving through a couple of black and white images just to give you a bit of a demonstration and I'll get more into the actual techniques of each. This one here is a very good example of repetition and receding distance and how your eye is drawn into uh, the image. What I wanted to tell you about, which really would help a lot of people out, is that there's three basic shapes in life. There's a square, there's a circle, and there's a triangle. And the lines that make up those three objects, the square, there's ver vertical and horizontal lines, circle, there's the curved line, and uh, di diagonal lines come out of triangles. Each of those lines has a different emotional effect on people if they're in a photograph. Now those lines could be implied. Um, they could be directly there, like the photograph you're looking at. The boards are diagonal a little bit. The edges of the wire framing the child's face is also diagonal. So it brings some tension into the photograph. It brings questions. It makes you want to explore it. On the other hand, if you have a circular one, you tend to be more interested in the, the gentleness, the curves. You understand how a circle makes you feel good, the sun in the sky, the curve of, uh, of um, a great automobile, those types of things. And then the other part is if you've got a square, the horizontal and vertical line, they tend to divide things, vertical line, and a horizontal line tends to divide things in a very peaceful manner. So or boring manner sometimes. So if you take a, uh, a heart monitor and it's, it's crashed and the person's dead, it's flat line. And it kind of relates to that in a photograph in a sense that it gets to be a little bit of a boring line unless you're very creative with it. But the one thing I have to point out is that rules are just guidelines. 
uh, rules are meant to be followed or used as a guideline and then you add your bit to it, like cooking. And at the same time, breaking rules will often bring you to some amazing images. So never be afraid to try something if it speaks to you in the viewfinder. Don't be afraid to speak out and, and go for it. So when I, let's go the right direction here. So a good example of black and white photography is that sometimes this, this image here is lacking a lot of tone and a lot of, uh, there's no real blacks, there's no real whites. It doesn't grab your eye. And this is one of those examples where you'd be much better off just shooting it in color. Some things are better in color. There's no question about it because color also brings an emotional impact to a photograph, much like lines do. So to give you an example of that, red, if you see red, you're thinking danger, violence, you're thinking anger. Um, if you see yellow, you're feeling a little bit more peaceful, but there's some risk and danger in there with fire and all those types of things. Blue calms you right down, green is environmental, it makes you feel very good. So those colors, when they're used, actually create an emotional impact to your photographs. So be very aware of colors as you're, as you're making photographs because it, they will affect how your viewer sees them. So when I talked about a vertical line dividing a photograph in half, essentially what will happen in that case is you'll see two different photographs, one on each side of that line, which unless they're connected in some manner, confuse the viewer and they often don't know which side to look at. So this photograph here by Emma Trin, um, she's got a, the contrails of a jet, but the jet has not left the scene at the top. So there's a little opening you can go around, you can visit both sides. So you're not stuck in each side. And at the same time, she's got these floating kites in there of different colors to grab your eye and divided right in the middle. So it's, I really like this image. These images that you're looking at from now on are going to be all students' work that have been delivered to me for the students staying on in the program. And they're all begin or mostly beginners. Emma's an advanced student. She's working in color digital. Um, so yeah, this to me, I just love this photograph. The greens, the reds, the dividing line. This is a very good example of your camera's limitations. So as you get closer to an object, your depth of field, the distance between the dog's nose and the eyes shrinks. So in other words, as you get closer, you cannot get a dog's nose, a long snout dog nose in focus as well as you can get the eyes unless you start using some of the camera's abilities, which means closing down the lens to a smaller opening, which means you get less light. That creates lots of other problems. But if you're just snapshotting, the best way to do this, instead of going in close and having the eyes out of focus or the nose out of focus, try stepping back more and then on your phone or on your computer, crop it afterwards. Because as you step back, the depth of field increases. Moving on. So motion is a very interesting thing to capture. Um, most people using their cameras, they'll run into the motion thing and their pictures will be blurred because your camera shutter speed's not fast enough. So for people using phones or automatic cameras and stuff, take advantage of the point, the apex of motion, which is what this is. This is by Eric Long. So his brother is shooting the basketball, but Eric waited until he was in the air at the point that he's gonna start coming down again. So he knew he could freeze the action. But if he had caught his brother going up or down, he would have been severely blurred. Next photograph is by uh, Jack Dohler. Um, I forget the assignment name for this, but basically it was uh, um, whatever he did, he did it exactly right for what the assignment was. The interesting part of this is it's got the diagonal lines or the horizontal and the vertical lines. And what he did by creating one image only and being able to be in the side image, you're able to connect with him and kind of leave the frame a little bit, but still stay with it. And the fact that it's broken speckled glass and the great lighting uh, creates a little bit of a sinisterism or a, or a ghostliness. So I always thought it was very excellent. He's also balanced out the squares or the rectangles very, very carefully. So they're almost all exactly the same. So there's a lot of thought that goes into some compositions and you get a lot of success. 
If anybody can guess what the power of this image is, it shouldn't be hard to figure out. It's the color red. And this image is by um, Livia Sass. And she took this photograph and captured the, so you've got circular lines, so that makes you feel kind of good, but they're almost diagonal and they're rep repetitive. So repetition, parallel lines, curves, those are all things that are very strong image making emotional reaction type things. So you have to think about that. Um, the doggy bag and the yellow bag and the red of the jacket is just perfectly put together. And then you've got this odd colored phone. So it's a mixed match of colors that don't really work together, but it's pulled together by those stripes in the background. And that's the key element in this one. Very powerful photograph. Great spot by uh, Olivia. Um, this is another image by Jack Dohler. So um, again, I forget what the subject matter was, but he decided to um, capture himself under red light, which is very difficult to do because the light is very low. So when the light is really low, you're going to run into a problem of camera shake or phone shake even. So you have to be, you have to hold the camera very steady or find something to prop it on and use a self timer. And then you have to keep extremely still. In the old days of photography, when studios were lit by the northern windows or northern skylights, uh, what would happen in those days is you'd sit in a chair with an iron clamp on the, your neck so that you wouldn't move because the exposures were so long because the light was so low. Fortunately, things have improved. Carrying on, this picture here is by um, Waka Yumida. And it, she was, I imagine this is shot out of her apartment window. Um, throwing, throwing the uh, lights of the traffic in the city out of focus by not focusing on them makes the lights larger. Um, there's a little thing called the bokeh effect where if you're using a long lens and you're not focused, the background lights or the background highlights will grow larger and that's called bokeh. That's a very popular effect. What I loved about this was there's, you've got your diagonal line, but you've also got this curved line and you've also got these straight lines there's just lines and colors everywhere. It's almost like an abstract, very, very interesting. It caught my eye. I was very pleased with it. But again, you can see how the randomness sometimes is, a, is the perfect um, compositional material. This is Amber Lees in uh, a far off tropical country, um, doing what we're not doing at this present time, but she took a photograph of herself under the shower and uh, very creatively, um, what's nice about this is that it's in focus and that's a critical part of this because every one of those water droplets are frozen, which can be like a shower, but it, it, it's just a very interesting shot. The way it's framed also by the trees around the face um, is very effective. So framing is another tool. So you can see by this image, her whole head is framed around a little circle of green. So that makes you feel good and it's an excellent way to draw your attention to the face, which is the main point. Uh, this image is by Victoria Hafke. Um, I think it's in her home. Um, I found this just brilliant because again, when I talked about the lines and the diagonal lines and the, um, you've got everything in here. You've got rectangles, you've got um, squares, you've got some diagonal lines of the stairs. And perfectly, she's got this look on her face of just not connectedness. Even her legs on the diagonal add to that movement of the image. Um, brilliant image, and I, it was one of my favorites again. Um, even the bottom line on the bottom, that horizontal line that provides a little bit of a base, of, of, a weight to the image is kind of important in my mind. Um, there is some horizontal and vertical lines in that image, but they uh, tend to be because the body crosses that vertical line, it doesn't interfere and make two different photographs. Again, a very good example of diagonal line use. This is by uh, Olivia again, Olivia Sass. And all she did was basically point the camera upwards and maintain those diagonals. So if this was shot straight across as a horizontal image instead of a diagonal, it wouldn't be as interesting, there wouldn't be any action, there wouldn't be any activity. Diagonal lines bring activity into an image. Horizontal lines tend to stop it, stop movement. So these diagonal lines, they bring a danger a little bit. It makes you feel the height, which is dangerous. 
Um, there's a person up there, the lights on the side like that. And again, her arms are even on the diagonal as well, which adds to the drama. The black triangle in the bottom is a little hard to deal with. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more light underneath there, but that's okay. Stunning picture. Another image by Eric Long. Um, uh, repetition, uh, sometimes disorderliness, uh, colors, multiple colors, all make a difference here. Um, when I evaluated this one with Eric, my only suggestion was we just take the right side off a little bit, crop it tighter, so that all we're dealing with is the toolbox. So you've got to be careful of these extra pieces in a photograph that draw a person's eye. So when you think about a photograph, the idea is if a person likes your photograph, they're going to look at it for a long period of time and really look into it. If the photograph does not catch their eye, they've moved on before they've got time to even think about it. So you don't want to give them those outs. You don't want to give them an exit. And you do that with compositional techniques. So in this case, I would move to the right side of this picture where the, brown, the blues are, and I see nothing in there, and I would keep going out of the picture. So I have to be careful of those types of things. Um, this is another image by Jack Dohler. Um, I believe this, this uh, assignment was called framing. So it was about how you frame an object to draw attention to it. Um, he did this very effectively. And it's got a bunch of techniques. So you've got the circle kind of shape in the middle, but it is kind of triangular. There's lots of triangles at the top. The stairway is really bothersome because it, the light draws you to the stairway and then you look at it and you go, well, that's a really stupid stairway. It's not making any sense. So it keeps you interested and it takes you eventually up to the house. Great image. And here's another image by Olivia Sass. And this is a um, nice and simple. A bowl on, uh, oops, sorry about that. It's a bowl sitting on a counter, like a chip counter, and some, I forget the name of pomegranate seeds, maybe. The strength of this image is purely the circles and the colors, and then the randomness of the red. Again, that red is such an important color. And the red seeds on the bottom. So the red seeds, you've got that white circles all around it. And then you've got the other uh, kind of off red, coppery, keeping you in, in the frame. And then if you do leave the frame, you've still got a lot of interesting things around the edges. So another really neat, interesting image. This one here is again by Olivia. I seem to have picked a lot of Olivia's, but um, this was called close up. So the idea was to move in close on an image as close as you can possibly go with your camera. So a lot of people don't realize, and I mentioned this earlier with the dog with the nose and the eyes, that if you move in close to a picture, the depth of field shrinks. So your point of focus becomes very, very narrow. So what I assigned the students to do was to move in as close as they could at the point that the focus starts slipping away and that's there where they would take their photo. But again, you can always move back. As you move back, your depth of field of focus increases and then you're able to crop it afterwards and you'll find that the depth is much better. The depth of focus is much better. And the other practical parts of this is you've got circles, you've got triangles, uh, you've got movement. Um, it just keeps you going all around it. It's hard to get out of this image when it's up there. So that's the power of that. And Jack Dollar. Um, this was another fill the frame image. And if anybody knows what that is, it's a barbecue brush. And the little white spots on the end falling out of focus, going into that little bit of a bokeh effect because of their out of focus getting larger, draws your eye back into the image. This image is about rep repetition again. That's a very valuable tool. Um, repetition, parallel lines, all those lines all have an emotional effect. So think about those things when you're making your photographs. The color red is also a very, very important part of this photograph. This is a very good example. So this is Grace Potosi. And uh, this photograph was very interesting to me because you've got a dividing object right in the middle of the tree. And it, it explains perfectly. So when you've got a dividing object, you can actually still have one image instead of two separate images because the horse is on both sides. So of course, you to see the whole image and share the entire image. And then there's a rule of thirds that we talked about a little bit amongst my students. So if you do intersecting lines on an image vertically and horizontally, 
where they intersect is where you would put a point of interest. This isn't using that as much, but one of those lines is in that third, that um, one third space. If that had been dead center like that, it would have had a completely different effect. But that one third space and the horse sharing the other space, and then you've got the other one third over here. There's power to that again, and there's implied lines. And it's a great photo. I like it. Um, this assignment for students was uh, by window light, teaching them to use window light to create beautiful portraits. Uh, Piper Davidson here did a wonderful job of this picture. And um, so window light is an amazing tool. If you have someone in front of a window and you take their picture, their face is always going to be dark. And when you lighten it up, it's always going to look really grainy or noisy. That's because the camera's measuring the light coming through the window. But if you have the person being lit by the window and you move over to the side of the person and take advantage of the light falling on their face instead of the light falling on the back of their head, you can turn out some very beautiful pictures. And if it's later afternoon or early morning light like this is, it tends to be very, very soft and flattering, which is wonderful for women's faces in particular. And so my friend Santiago Erding, one of my favorites because, uh, photographers, because he, he turns out these really wild things sometimes. So this was one of his subjects. And it's the hilarity of the presentation. A peanut butter and jam piece of bread presented in this manner. I thought that the hilarity in the story was the compositional technique that made this image really good. Uh, the background is good too. Um, and just the way it's positioned is really nice. The lighting's nice. But again, the frivolity, the humor is sometimes a very, very effective compositional tool because you will probably remember this. I will. And Santiago again, he, he had a lot of creative ideas. He, he must have had some free time at home. He, um, I haven't really figured out how he did all this one, but to me, this was a brilliant image. Perfect example of circle, perfect example of wind. And um, there's other, as there's a lot of aspects in this image that make a very successful image. And I, I congratulate him on that. Hopefully my, I'm not giving you any trouble with my internet, just that I'm going weird. So um, again, circles. They really make the difference. This is repetition. This is horizontal and vertical lines. This is an image divided almost exactly in the middle. It's interesting because if you stay in the image, you start reading the titles. But it, it's, it's hard to stay in the image because the edges are all open. So if it was boxed in, you would tend to stay inside. But if you look at it, you tend to want to leave the edges because there's no, no blocking you in. So you have to be careful of that technique. It's still a wonderful picture. And that's by uh, Serena, Serena Muller. Um, this was back in the beginning of the photography um, COVID assignments that we started. And this one's by Jack Peary. And we were talking about isolation. So this image was his representation of isolation. Again, he's tilted the photograph a little bit so that the, the diagonal line is creating some danger and some fear. The looking through the open blinds, peeking through the reflection, all those diagonal lines heading towards him, pointing at his eyes. There's a whole number of features in this that are effective. Um, so, and again, this is Harrison Sharp. I apologize, he didn't send a very large format image in here. But again, this is going to be the parallel or the curved lines sweeping through the image and the circle and the positioning again. So the positioning of this is in the one third. So it tends to keep you over here and then you follow the, the, the red wire to the bird. Anybody give me a shout if I'm running out of time there, Mark, too, please. Um, again, this was the isolation assignment. What I loved about this is that uh, Trekker chose uh, Trek James, he chose black and white to uh, do this. He sat the chair almost in the exact corner, but if he had put the exact corner, he would have had the line coming out of the top of his head, which wouldn't work. But he's off to the side slightly, and he's got that look on his face. 
And the wallpaper is the kind of thing that if I was in isolation for much longer, I would probably start seeing that in the back of my mind. So it, it all kind of fits with that isolation technique. Remember those lines and then down at the bottom, you've got some diagonal lines. He's looking away and he's got space to look away into. So I'm, uh, I was very pleased with that. And this is Jack Peary again. This was his version of um, isolation, which is not so much about techniques or compositional techniques, but it's that frivolity, that humor again, that works so well in photographs because it's, this one sticks with you, but it's not because of a lot of techniques. The one technique that works really here is get down to your subject. How many times do you photograph a dog or a kid standing six feet above them or four feet above them? Time to get down lower and start talking to people on their own level because then you're gonna get photographs that really seem like you're with them and connected with them. Um, I'm near the end here now. So what I was gonna say here is that uh, keep happy. When you're doing portraits, move in close. It's okay to cut a little bit of a head off. Don't cut people off for the feet. Make sure you haven't got a tree growing out of their head. I know that's an old joke, but you'd be surprised at how many people do not look at their backgrounds. So the real key for photography is before you take the picture, unless it's a really good one, you got to snap it. Look around the frame. Look what's sticking out of their head. Look at the bright color in the distance that people are going to be distracted by. Those type of things. Um, with all this going on, be happy, everybody. Wash your hands. And my last thoughts on photography is that as you're looking through the viewfinder, you're looking at an Im you're creating an image in your mind that your mind is helping you create. So if you free your mind to create rather than get all these rules and everything in place, you're gonna have the freedom to create images from the backlog or from the storage vault that you have in your mind of images. And you can create images much easier that way than interfering too much in the process by trying to do it perfectly. If you're looking through the viewfinder and you go, oh, that's really nice, take it. Don't figure it out why it's nice. Figure it out afterwards why it's nice, or even figure, take the photo on the screen on your camera, look at the photo and go, oh, I really like that, but I could have done this and then do another a shot. You'll find it works effectively well. So um, I don't know how I end these things. <laughs> That's all right. I really enjoyed that. Um, give it up for Mr. Fletcher. Thank you. Um, yeah, oh, um, we're done for the day. So uh, if anyone has any questions or anything, you can put that into the chat or the question and answer area. We'll be happy to get them. Um, but yeah, no, we're good to go. I'm going to throw up just the ending slide, but uh, if you guys have any more questions, let us know. So Mark, I've got a, a number of people here that want to chat. So all I got to do is just click on that, right? Yeah, if you bring up that chat area, um, uh, you'll see right now we have a bunch of messages in chat. Okay, I, I'll review those then and then, uh, oh, I see, they're all not bad. Oh, perfect. It's all good. Everybody said thank you. <laughs> right on. So um, if any of my student photographers are on, we're still meeting as usual at 2.45 today. So check in with me if you can. Appreciate it. All right. We'll see you guys later. Okay. Thanks.